Learning to program is a rewarding, if slightly frustrating skill everyone should have the opportunity to try. And today, there's so much choice. You can be anything from a web developer or game developer, all the way down to a low level, bare metal programmer who writes code for microcontrollers. And the variety of languages on offer is almost endless. It wasn't always like this. Let's go back to the 80s, where your main choices were basic or raw assembly language. How did we get started programming back then? And in fact, how do you even cram a programming environment into a computer that only has 64K of address space? I mean, I bet some of you who write code for a living have source files larger than that. And yet, back then, the code, programming language, and the data had to fit into that 64K. Let's find out how by going right back to Christmas, sometime in the early 1980s. Everyone has a moment in time where something they were exposed to becomes a defining feature of their life. For me, it was Christmas sometime in the mid 80s. And I'm curious, if like me, computing is your thing, what was your first exposure to a computer? Was it in a carefully controlled classroom setup? Or did your confused and somewhat clueless parents buy one and just leave you to work it out? And if you got kids who are into this stuff, how did they start? Did you go to a lot of effort to surprise them like my parents did? Because looking back, they went on to a surprising amount of effort to set all this up. You see, we're at my grandparents for Christmas holiday and I was led downstairs on Christmas morning by my parents, taken into the dining room and there, set up in the corner, was my grandma's old TV and an Acorn Electron. So they must have set it up before going to bed, checked it all worked and then slipped down in the morning to switch it all on again. The telly was one of those Evil Edna style wood grain boxes that had its own stand, big chunky thing that took 30 seconds to warm up and had a certain electronic smell to it. At the time, I had no idea what an Acorn Electron was or just how fundamental this experience would be to my future. I don't think my parents did either. They thought I'd get bored after a few months, so they bought me a cheap computer. Oh, how they were wrong. They were so very, very wrong. On the screen was nothing but a flashing cursor and the words, Acorn Electron, basic. This younger version of me had no clue about computing. I knew what computers were, I knew I wanted one, and I knew this was a computer in front of me, and more importantly, it was mine. But beyond that, I had no idea what was going on. Computer lessons weren't a thing at this point in time. All I had was the machine, a few tapes, and the user's guide. Now, being a kid of the 80s, it was kind of accepted knowledge that computers accepted commands. I'd used typewriters before and understood you press keys and letters appeared on the screen. The commands to type though were cryptic and didn't mean much to me. All I knew was that tape went in a tape player and I typed the word chain for some reason and then some speech marks. And I only knew that because it was printed on the label of the tape. I don't actually have many more memories of using my Electron. I think I outgrew it pretty quickly because either next Christmas or the one after I received a Spectrum Plus 3 which has a whole 128K of RAM and a floppy drive. And I spent hours of my time using it, typing out pages and pages of basic listings. I played games on it too, but when tapes take five minutes to load, you get a bit choosy over what you're gonna play. We typed out basic listings because that's just how things were, but also because it felt like you were using the computer for something. The interaction with the machine was more important than what it was actually doing. So how did programming on these machines actually work? To figure that out, we need to go inside the machine and look how it functions. So we're pretty spoiled today, with multi-monitor computers, gigabytes of RAM, and over a dozen different languages to choose from. You can see I'm literally sat in front of a machine with more screens than I have eyeballs. And I can just go online and download any programming language I feel like playing with. I mean, given a choice, I'd still pick C or C++. I would rather use it on some sort of Unixy type machine, but that's a video for the future. And you might have seen from some of my earlier videos that programming an 8-bit machine is quite a laborious task of precisely choosing the correct instructions, putting them together in the correct sequence. You're always fighting the sheer lack of address space, not RAM, but address space. We often think RAM is the scarce resource to be rationed out, but really it's the address space. Here's a ZX Spectrum. It contains a Z80 CPU. This is what we call an 8-bit CPU because functionally it works on data in units of 8 bits. 
Yes, pedants out there, I know it has a 4-bit ALU and some of the 8-bit registers can be paired up to be 16 bits wide, but it communicates with the outside world 8 bits at a time. The CPU is wired to the outside world using a data bus and an address bus. The data bus is 8 bits wide, but the address bus is 16 bits wide. The address bus is how the CPU tells the RAM where it wants to store data. Being 16 bits wide, it can address any memory location from 0 to 65,535, or 64K as you might better know it. That is all the CPU can address, 64K. As a programmer though, the whole 64K is not available to us. So with this 64K of address space, the designers of the Spectrum reserved certain sections for specific tasks. Here's a diagram of the memory layout in a Spectrum. You'll notice 16K of it has been used by the ROM. The ROM contains a machine's software. It's how it knows how to be a Spectrum and not an Amstrad or something else. The ROM chip is wired to the CPU in the same way the RAM is except the design of the machine ensures that the first 16k of address space is wired to the ROM chip and then the rest goes to the RAM chips. There's a big custom chip in the middle of the machine called the ULA. That handles how the CPU and RAM are physically attached to each other. If you ask for an address in RAM in the first 16k, the ULA reroutes the signals to the ROM chip instead. If we look back at the RAM in the Spectrum, the actual free space we can use for our code is around 40k. The rest is used for the display and things to keep the system running. But we can't use all of that 40k for our program. When you write a program, it's done in a high level language and they don't come much higher than basic. Computers only understand machine code, which is their native language. It's pure binary. Humans don't understand pure binary and find writing machine code quite difficult. I've got some earlier videos in attempting this. So we invented high level languages that use words and are easier for us to think in. And in the 1980s, the most popular was called BASIC. It stands for the catchy, beginners, all purpose, symbolic instruction code. BASIC is what's known as an interpreted language, which we'll get to in a moment. Let's focus on the mechanics of how our little Z80 based spectrum makes sense of a piece of code, such as the good old 10 print hello, 20 go to 10. To be able to type that into the computer, software needs to be running. That software lives in the ROM. It provides quite a lot of functionality. Even if the screen looks largely blank, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. The keyboard is constantly being scanned for key presses. The characters are then being drawn to the screen. Every time the enter key is pressed, that line of code is stored in the machine's RAM. If the program needs to store data, that also needs storing in RAM. In our case, it's that text, hello. All of this needs to fit within the 40k we have available. For a short program like this, that's not a problem. Some basic programs are quite large though. Things are suddenly getting a bit tight. Suddenly our 40k doesn't seem quite a lot. Sinclair though, had a cunning trick to save memory. Early on in my computing explorations, I spent a lot of time with my Acorn and ZX Spectrum and I really enjoyed using them. But being a kid, I didn't have a lot of software so I had to resort to typing in my own code. At this point, I had zero clue how to even think up a program of my own. So I spent hours just copying out code from books and magazines. These books and magazines always mention lots of random other computers I'd never heard or seen of before. A C64, whatever that was. A BBC, which by now I'd heard of. We had one at school and my mate whose parents were doctors had one of his own, because of course he did. Some of these programs required something called a 48K spectrum. I figured out that I had a 128k spectrum. I mean, it's plastered on the front of the case, it's a bit obvious. And in the menu was a 48k mode, which I worked out was the same as a 48k spectrum, whatever that thing was still. I didn't like using the 48k mode either. It had this really awkward way of entering code. Instead of typing out the characters, all you had to do was hit a single key and a complete word was typed out for you. Only on 128k spectrums, None of those words were printed on the keys, so you had no idea which button did what, and it was all very confusing. What I didn't realise at the time was how this odd way of typing was a clever trick Sinclair engineers had come up with to save RAM. Remember, we're trying to jam a functional computer and software into 64k of address space, and the program is left with a mere 40k of that for their actual code. It's a bit like those cheap Windows 10 tablets with 128 gig of storage, 
By the time Windows is installed, there's no room for anything else. Basic on the Spectrum was made with this in mind though. Here's how it worked. When programming, our code has to be turned into machine code. It can either be done all at once using a compiler that spits out a file containing the machine code, or it can be done line at a time using a process called interpretation. BASIC is what's known as an interpreted language. Every line gets read, understood, and converted to machine code. Then that line of code is executed. Then the next line gets read in and the cycle continues. It doesn't store the compiled code anyway, it just runs it and then goes on to the next one. Compiled languages are faster because the compilation step happens once and never needs doing again, but you need to store the compiled code somewhere to be reused later. On a system like the Spectrum where tape is the main storage medium, that's just not practical. Interpreters are slow, but it was about the only way a computer with barely any RAM could allow a user to program the machine using itself. Another thing that saves memory is not actually storing the raw text for the program. The Spectrum has a really clever trick where the character set contains all the basic keywords represented by individual characters. You know the ASCII table, that standardised arrangement of letters, numbers and symbols that means every machine can read text from any other machine. In the early 80s that hadn't yet caught on. Sinclair were doing their own thing. The Spectrum's character set contained all the letters and numbers of the alphabet, symbols, some drawing characters, and then every single basic keyword. The keywords were stored as codes, just like the letters were and the numbers. It's an insanely clever trick. You see, the problem with programming is making sense of the user's input. There's a sequence of steps that gets given the simple name of parsing and the more fancy name of lexical analysis. It's that bit of programming where some tool scans the text and points out all the typos, and then if there are none, tries to convert the text into an internal representation of the meaning of what you're trying to do. So something has to take the letters P-R-I-N-T, understand that it says the word print, and then figure out what that is as a set of instructions to the computer. And doing all that takes code. Something has to run in the background to make that work. And with 16K of ROM, there's barely enough space in there to do that. So Sinclair came up with a way to build the parsing into the text entry. If the user can see complete words on the keyboard, on each key, they don't have to type each word out, which means they can't spell them wrong. This means assumptions can be made about the user's input. Every basic line consists of a number, a space, and then a keyword. That's how it has to be in Sinclair Basic. It can't be anything else. And then whatever data is relevant to that keyword. So a simple state machine can keep track of what's going on. So it knows that as soon as you've typed in some numbers and press space, it will switch to keyword entry mode. Whatever keyword you type in by pressing the button, it can then figure out what to do next and like lock the input so that you can only type in what it wants you to type in. So when you type in code in Sinclair Basic, all you're doing is typing in numbers that get stored. Each basic instruction only requires a byte each, and it allows much longer programs to be entered in the machine. It's so simple and yet so clever, and it's like 100% Sinclair thinking. Make a cheap computer that's barely functional, but good enough. This process of converting text into a code is known as tokenization, and the codes are called tokens. It isn't the only way of doing things. I mentioned I used to own an Acorn Electron, which was a cut down version of the BBC Micro. Let's see how BBC Basic works. The BBC really does make the Spectrum look like a cheap kid's toy. I'm sure it really was an advanced design sent back in time or something. The BBC Micro is a fantastic machine, clearly invented by people from the future. It's still an 8-bit machine, but the designers weren't trying to make the cheapest computer possible. They were trying to make the most useful machine. They'd won a contract from the UK government to put this thing in all the schools. They had a lot of choices of what to put in it. They had a lot of freedom. The Spectrum had an edge connector on its back to connect extra devices to. The BBC Micro had several. You could plug disk drives into it. There was internal support for even more upgrades. And if you got the crack version, it even had built-in networking in the 1980s. It was so adaptable that ARM, the company that created the design for the CPU in all your smartphones, and ultimately the new Mac M1, created their first CPU designs using that machine. 
It was still an 8-bit machine though, with the same 64k address space. But it had a tactic for dealing with this that was becoming popular. It was a process called bank switching. Although on the BBC, it was given the name of sideways ROM. Bank switching is a system where more memory can be wired to the CPU than it can really handle. And through some clever signaling and some basic logic, blocks of memory can be switched in and out while the machine is running as it's executing code without crashing. I do need to point out that the 128K Spectrum also used bank switching. This was in the BBC from the very first version. And it allowed the BBC Micro to have a real operating system running inside it. Most computers of the time had a basic interpreter running and everything was done through that. The BBC had something called MOS or Machine Operating System. You could even pull out what it called the language ROM and swap BASIC for another language. BBC BASIC is generally regarded as a little bit good, even by people who don't like BASIC. In fact, it's still in use today. You can run RISC OS on a Raspberry Pi and it includes BBC BASIC. I've got this little single board computer called an Aegon Lite and that runs BBC BASIC. Neither of these are retro computers. It's still quite alive. And there's a spider. There is a spider making a web in front of my face. Let's just get it and... I'll get off my finger. You can live on the floor. On an 8-bit machine, the only way to get data into it was to type it on the keyboard. Yes, you could load it off a tape, but someone had to type it in first. And the machine only ran BASIC. So if they wanted to write something that required the power of the machine and couldn't cope with being in BASIC, which was quite slow, they had to first write it on paper and figure out all the assembly by hand, then manually hand assemble that into the raw bytes that needed to be in the machine. But then to get those raw bytes in the machine, they had to write a BASIC program to do it. So on a Spectrum, executing machine code programs requires you to use this basic keyword that's called USR, and then you give it a memory location. So a lot of basic assembly programs were often put into the last 32K of RAM. Now over in BBC land, things were much simpler. You could just write the assembler as words in line with the basic, and the BBC would just assemble it for you when you ran the basic program. It was like groundbreakingly new at the time that you could do this. You might have noticed something from that previous bit. You start off with basic and you learn how the machine works and you learn what programming is, but you reach a point where the basic programs you're writing just don't work fast enough and you need to use something better. It was a very good language for showing people how programming worked, but those same people soon outgrew it. It was both the most widely used language, but also the one with the poorest reputation. We probably should see why people didn't like BASIC. Was it just snobby programmers? Or were there actual reasons nobody writing games, for example, did them in BASIC? BASIC had a bit of a poor reputation. It was like, kids wrote in BASIC, real programmers learned assembly and hand-assembled code the hard way. That's the way it was done. If you're a real programmer, you are sat up till three in the morning writing machine code on a piece of paper. To be fair, that is also the best way to make the machine work quickly. You are dealing with, at best, a two to four, maybe eight megahertz CPU, which when that's chewing through BASIC, it's slower than rush hour traffic on my route to work. The nature of BASIC also doesn't lend itself to readable code. Remember, this is the 1980s. We don't have multiple screens. You can't have a second monitor with your code on it. You can't, in fact, format the code to be readable. It's being presented on the machine's native resolution. We're also used to other nice things like indenting the code, syntax highlighting, and at least lines that fit entirely on the screen so you can read them. BASIC had none of that. Often the editors were very, very rudimentary. As in, if you wanted to edit a line of code, you just retyped it back in. However, BASIC is a bit like a modern language that gets a bit of a hard time from real programmers that one being Python. You see that is also interpreted, and depending on your opinion, it either has a very strict, restrictive formatting style that is not very nice at all, that whole white space thing, 
or it's a really nice guide for newbie programmers to learn how to lay out code that's readable. But, like Python, BASIC was many people's first exposure to programming. And that's something we've lost over time. When you have to learn how to program just so you can enjoy a game of Rainbow Islands or Chucky Egg, and when a magazine prints a listing of exciting games that rarely are, it's hard to avoid becoming at least a bit familiar with programming as a concept. We don't have that today. Trying to get started with Python requires knowledge of how to install that first, and that it even exists. And then it needs people like me to give you structured lessons so that you don't give up and lose interest after five minutes when you just get red text on your screen because you maybe typed a bracket wrong. If you're like me, and it feels like computing has gone too far towards being overly user-friendly, and that the fun rough edges that taught you about the machine have been removed, it might please you to know newbie Python programmers still find typing in the Python equivalent of 10 print hello, 20 go to 10, just as amusing when they figure out that the word hello could be any word they like, and they get equally excited making a basic number guessing game, when they toil away for half a lesson trying to spot a single syntax error that I've already spotted and I'm just being mean making them pick it out themselves. So don't worry, we might not have basics shoved in our faces from day one, but future programmers are being encouraged. In a future video, I'll look at another language that was around then, but it wasn't as popular. A language called Forth. If 8-bit computers were kids' toys and basic was a toy language, Forth was a real language that ran on toy computers. It's also a very, very strange language, unlike anything we use now. It requires a totally different way of thinking. If you want to know when that video comes out, you know how YouTube works, click the little icons below. And I'll see you later.